turned out nice again. Oh well, I'll see you when you're 50, hopefully. I was just beginning to think I missed my chance when it started to get light. Then off it roared. After 40 years of fishing, after I got it in the net, I was shaking. Carp fishing in France has come a long, long way in a very short time. So much so that it seems hard to believe that the modern English style of carp fishing has only been practiced in France for a little over a decade. Nowadays, it is virtually impossible to pick up a magazine or angling newspaper without being blitzed by pictures and stories of massive French carp. Here he comes. One of the original pioneers was an English angler, Rod Hutchinson, who led the way on the huge public lakes such as St. Cassien. But it was only when Dutch, German and French carp anglers themselves began taking an interest that carp fishing in France was well and truly opened up. However, as British anglers have learnt more about the hazards as well as the rewards of fishing in France, they have quickly discovered that carp fishing on publicly owned lakes and rivers is not as easy as they first thought. The French authorities have an uneasy relationship with carp anglers. Night fishing, though becoming more widely accepted, may well still be banned on the lake you plan to visit. The authorities regularly drain the lakes that supply drinking water and hydroelectric power and sell all the carp. They may close the water to fishing for no apparent reason or even sell the fishing rights to private individuals. It's all too easy for things to go drastically wrong. That little piece of heaven your mate fished last year may be empty and devoid this year. It was this uncertainty, together with the ever-increasing influx of relative newcomers to French carp fishing from Holland, Germany and France, that has forced many English anglers to search out more of a sure thing in the shape of English-owned and run, pay-to-fish lakes. Such a water is Rainbow Lake. In these videos, we hope to show you everything you need to know about planning a successful trip to France. From bait and tackle, to advice on travelling to your destination. We'll look at continental motoring, insurance cover, the sort of equipment you're likely to need, and of course, the best ways to set a trap for those giant French heavy, carp. We shall be fishing at Rainbow Lake, a 100-acre paradise not far from the town of Bordeaux, close to the rolling Atlantic beaches and right in the heart of France's premier wine-growing country. A venue brimming over with big carp to over 60 pounds in weight. However, though Rainbow is a pay-to-fish lake, both the videos are structured to reflect all types of French carp fishing from the huge inland seas to tiny streams and rivers. When you've finished watching these films, we hope you'll find you have no more questions to ask about fishing in the mecca of the carp world. We also hope you'll have had your appetites well and truly whetted by some of the delights awaiting you at the fabulous Rainbow Lake. So, where shall we start? Uh, 
As you start to look more closely at the detail of your French fishing trip, you'll quickly realise that a major consideration involves the planning itself. If you think that all you have to do to catch monsters in France is to get off the ferry and wait for them to fall into your waiting arms, think again. The whole trip will almost certainly stand or fall on the strength and the amount of pre-departure planning and research that you've carried out. While this may not be so vital if you're going to fish one of the pay lakes, such as Rainbow Lake, it becomes of paramount importance if you're thinking of fishing a public barrage or a stretch of river. A big part of the planning jigsaw involves simply getting to the lake in the first place. The ferry route, the driving, the tolls and the fuel costs, everything must be considered well in advance in order to get the most out of your trip. We'll look at the ferry crossings and the driving in France in a minute. First, let's look at all the other pieces of the jigsaw. Unless you're absolutely certain that your chosen venue is up to scratch, in other words, that the carp are still in the lake, or that it won't be subject to a close season during your planned visit, you would be far better advised to fish somewhere like Rainbow Lake, especially if it is your first visit to France. For the moment, let's assume that you are a pioneering spirit and you fancy doing a starship enterprise. You know, boldly going where no man has gone before. What do you need to consider before setting off? Get you put on the insurance and then we can split the driving, can't we? Well, I said, if they'll have me. Yeah, I think they will. Do you reckon? I think they will. That's great. Yeah. One of the most important, yet often largely neglected aspects when planning any French trip is the actual timing of your visit. Traditionally, most UK carp men prefer to take their trip abroad during what was the close season. But lately, the summer and autumn months have become more popular. However, it has to be remembered that nowadays many German, Dutch and, of course, French anglers fish all the year round. And with carp fishing growing in popularity every year, lakes that were once deserted for all but the most popular continental holiday months are now quite likely to be busy throughout the year. Every season has its advantages and disadvantages. You'll find that if you plan your trip for the spring, say April to June, the ferries will be cheaper and less busy. The main roads, less crowded, and the campsites practically empty with no screaming kids. And a real plus, the lakes should be less infested with the usual hordes of other water users. Pests such as sailboarders, water skiers, and weekend sailors are guaranteed to have you pulling your hair out. And if you get really lucky, you may enjoy the best of the weather before the full, blistering heat of a French summer makes fishing almost unbearable. The summer months can be a nightmare. Just about the whole of France, Germany, Belgium and Holland seems to be on holiday during August. The traffic, especially at the toll booths on the most popular motorways, can be horrendous. I spent three hours just trying to get through the tolls outside Lyon in August 1992. The public stretches of the rivers and barrages will invariably be packed with holiday makers from dawn till dusk. Fishing can be a nightmare. Unless, of course, you're fishing a private lake such as Rainbow. Fluctuating water levels create their own problems. The longer and drier the French summer, the more local towns and villages call upon nearby lakes and rivers for supplies of fresh water. The EDF lakes still need to draw tons of water through their turbines and without the heavy rains of winter to top up the lakes, the levels can fall alarmingly fast. What might have been a comfy swim last year may be high and dry this, requiring a route march through a hundred yards of mud simply to get to the water's edge. On the other hand, autumn rain may raise the level alarmingly overnight, to say nothing of it pushing the carp all over the lake as the levels fluctuate. You only have to look at the huge Lac du Der Chantico a 12,000 acre water supply reservoir that indirectly supplies Paris with fresh water throughout the summer months. In the autumn it resembles a mud bath. In the spring the level can be 50 yards past the tree line. Barrages and rivers below the Massif Central and in the basins of the rivers Rhone, Rhine, Moselle and Saône are also affected by melting snow each year. 
The steady flood of very cold water not only keeps levels above normal, but it also puts the carp off the feed. So, as you can see, it's not all beer and skittles. There are 101 things to plan and sort out before you even get on the ferry. And we still haven't talked about bait, tackle and clothing yet. Though to a large extent, your choice of ferry crossing depends on your eventual destination and to a lesser extent on where you live, there are other things that should be taken into consideration. With the exception of Cherbourg, all the French Channel ports are serviced by a decent motorway system that starts within a few kilometres of the port. So once you're off the ferry, you should be on your way almost immediately. However, Lave and Dieppe can get desperately congested at times and this may add an hour or more to your journey. Cherbourg, which is situated at the tip of the Cotentin Peninsula, involves at least a three-hour journey from the nearest southbound motorway, though the eastbound one starts at Caen, about 60 miles away. Calais is without doubt the best port of entry. You get off the boat and you are immediately on your way. Now that the Channel Tunnel is open, ferry companies have had to take a good look at their prices and there are some real bargains on offer now. It is as well to shop around for the best prices and if you are not fussy about travelling at unpopular times you should be able to get substantial reductions on some of the unsocial oh, hours sailings. Look out for special return rates covering 8 or 10 day really saver soft. sailings. Right. These too reduce the overall cost of the ferry as they are about 20% cheaper than open ended return fares. Motor caravans, towing caravans, trailers and high vehicles are usually all charged a supplement. The most popular ferry routes are Dover-Calais, Hull-Zeebrugge, Ramsgate-Dunkirk, Plymouth-Roscoff, Plymouth-Santander in Spain for easier access to the southwest of France, Portsmouth-Le Havre, Portsmouth-Bilbao also in Spain, New Haven-Dieppe and Portsmouth-Saint-Malo. The routes into Cherbourg can add hours to your journey as you struggle to get off the Cotentin Peninsula heading south. Once you have decided on a venue, booked the ferry and studied the route, you will invariably find that you haven't got room for you and all your mates gear in the car. It happens. As we mentioned earlier, you can never have too much room for tackle, food, clothes and so on. But you will probably need to make compromises at some stage you may even want to consider hiring a van. Yeah. The French are much more sympathetic towards diesel-powered cars and vans than we are, and diesel fuel in France is much cheaper than petrol. Depending upon the exchange rate, you will find petrol costs approximately 30 to 40 pence more a gallon than in the UK, whereas diesel can be about 50 pence a gallon cheaper than its British equivalent. The cheapest fuel is invariably found in the towns at large supermarkets. Country service stations may be as much as 10p a litre dearer, while fuel from the motorway services can be even pricier still. Make sure your vehicle is properly serviced and in top class working order. You will need to fit headlight beam conversion kits to allow for driving on the right, and a warning triangle should be carried at all times, even if you've got hazard warning lights on the vehicle. Spare bulbs, which are compulsory, belts and clutch and accelerator cables are also recommended, as are a first aid kit and a fire extinguisher. Don't forget your driving license, green card of motor insurance, GB sticker and the vehicle's registration document. Plan your route carefully. The French main roads are generally less crowded than ours, so it may pay to do more driving over there rather than travel extra miles in the UK simply for the sake of saving just a few miles in France. Though bear in mind the cost of the tolls you may have to pay. 
make every effort to avoid the rush hours in the bigger towns, even though they are usually bypassed. The Paris Ring Road, the dreaded peripherique, can be a nightmare. With its almost perpetual congestion, it makes the M25 look like a deserted country lane. If at all possible, travel around Paris in the early morning, when the traffic is at its lightest. Avoid the Paris rush hours like the plague. It is better to wait until the office traffic is off the road. It should also be noted that the routes into and out of Paris can be very busy and congested at the weekends and at holiday times. At peak holiday times, the routes to the south of France through Lyon can be very crowded, but are, unfortunately, difficult to avoid. If you're going to travel on the autoroutes, be warned that huge queues may build up at the toll gates. The ones just outside Lyon are notorious. Obviously, you will need up-to-date roadmaps. The Michelin maps are usually on sale in the bigger branches of WH Smiths and at other large newsagent chains. Or you can buy them in France at the hypermarkets, where there is a wider choice at a lower cost. The road system in France takes some getting used to. The main autoroutes are fast, well-maintained highways, while some of the C-class roads are a fitter's nightmare. Bear in mind that you will have to pay tolls on the French motorways. The journey from Calais to the south of France can cost about £45 each way, though other charges vary from motorway to motorway. Just a word of warning now, French traffic police know the exact distances between the toll booths and the minimum length of time it takes to travel from one to another at the legal speed limit. As your ticket is time stamped as you collect it, they can tell if you've been speeding by simply checking the time it takes you to travel between the two booths. And they take no prisoners. You'll be fined on the spot, and if you've really been tanking it, you may even end up in jail until the next day, awaiting an appearance in front of a French magistrate. The speed limit on motorways is 130 kph, in dry weather and 110 kph when it's raining or in poor visibility. An 80 kph minimum speed limit applies to the overtaking lane of motorways in daylight and during good weather. Some of the French roads are a joy to drive on, so if you're in no great hurry or have not got to travel all that far, stick to the back roads. Some of the D roads run arrow straight for many miles and are often devoid of traffic and some non-tolled dual carriageways are often almost deserted. On the other hand, some of the busier N roads are only single carriageway, with the occasional stretches of limited dual carriageway to allow for overtaking. These roads carry a great deal of heavy lorry traffic, get stuck behind a lorry convoy, and that's it. There's almost no way past. Driving on the right is a piece of cake, provided you keep your eyes open and don't start taking things for granted too soon. You may want to break your journey somewhere. Campsites are usually well marked on the maps, off the main roads and in the towns, or you can buy the excellent Michelin camping guide. The tourist office, Le Syndicat d'Initiative, will be happy to give you a printed list of campsites and B&Bs. Alternatively, buy a copy of the Routard guidebook, which lists hundreds of B&Bs, fermes auberges, and rural holiday cottages throughout France. The best and cheapest places to eat are off the motorways. Get hold of the Relay Routier Guide, which lists the equivalent of British truck stops in France. Don't expect greasy spoon food, though. Like all Frenchmen, French truckers like their grub, and you will be offered a four or five course meal, often with wine included, for around a fiver. Personal and travel insurance is vital. Your ferry company or travel agent will be able to arrange this, but bear in mind that you could find cheaper and better cover through a local broker or through your own insurance agent. The AA's five-star standard vehicle service is expensive, but very comprehensive. While an excellent breakdown, get you home service, is offered by the RAC, called Reflex Europe. This covers you for all your UK driving as well very worthwhile and comparatively inexpensive if you travel abroad more than once or twice a year. Personal and medical insurance for a 10-day trip will cost about 15 to 20 pounds per person, depending on the extent of cover provided. 
you should also obtain a form from your local DHSS office called a Form E111. This is a reciprocal agreement with other EEC countries that allows you to claim back 70 to 80 percent of any medical fees incurred while abroad. Don't forget to get a green card motor insurance which transfers your normal UK car insurance cover to allow for continental use. Though this is no longer compulsory, it is strongly recommended as proof of cover. It certainly cuts through red tape in the event of an accident and, believe me, the French invented red tape. If you're with a company that charges for green card cover, complain. You should be able to wheedle at least 30 days free green card cover from most vehicle insurers. Barclay Cover offers just such a service. Most carp anglers planning their first trip to France haven't the faintest idea about what bait to take with them and, more importantly, just how much they should take. It is far better to take too much bait, bringing back what you don't use, rather than not enough. Sure, a lot depends on how deep your pocket may be, but the last thing on which to skimp and save is your bait. As a general rule of thumb, you should not consider taking less than 10 kilos of boilies and 10 kilos of groats or seeds per person per week. That is the minimum. You may well need even more. Do not despair though. Millet and maize are readily available throughout France. And nowadays you can even buy ready-made boilies in many tackle shops. However, French boilies are not cheap, so it really is better to take plenty with you. It is important to make sure that your preferred baits are permitted on the water you intend to fish. Some private owners, for example, do not permit the use of seed or particle baits. Some particles are not allowed on rainbow, for instance. Don't be put off by this. Even if you can't use particles, boily crumb or trout pellets are just as effective, if not more so. However, if cost is a major consideration and you need to create a cheap yet highly attractive bait carpet, then seed baits should get the swim bubbling. The first arrivals may not necessarily be carp. They may be bream or tench, small fry or even crayfish. It doesn't matter. It is vital to get the swim boiling with feeding fish. And the best way to do this is with mini baits, boily crumb or seeds. Even if the carp don't show an instant interest, the feeding activity of the smaller fish should attract them onto your baited area sooner rather than later. Of all the seed baits, groats are by far the best, due in no small part to their ease of preparation. Alternatively, why not try a blend of equal parts of groats, flaked maize and any seed mix, as shown here. While the blend works a little bit better if it has been boiled beforehand, it works almost as well with just an overnight soak. Ready-mades probably account for the downfall of more big French carp than any other type of bait. They are convenient, smell and taste good, and are relatively cheap if purchased in bulk. However, ridiculously cheap ready-mades represent false economy. They are usually far too soft to withstand the attentions of those dreaded bait robbers, crayfish and poisson chat, to say nothing of the huge shoals of bream which inhabit most French lakes. Cheap ready-mades are produced from very poor quality foodstuffs and they've even been known to blow before the end of a trip. Their flavour level leaks out of them far too fast, as does the colour, and all in all they're a waste of money and could spell the ruin of your whole trip. Always buy top-name brands of ready-mades, such as these products from the Nutribates range. 
These are made using high quality ingredients and all contain not just a single flavour, as in the case of cheap baits, but a complete flavour blend, often incorporating flavours and essential oils, even a liquid food ingredient in some cases. They are tough and uniform and will stand up to the attentions of the most aggressive bait robbers. These ready-made boilies from the KM product range have also been very effective over the years, with a pedigree that has stood the test of time. We hope to be able to show you how good these baits are as the video unfolds. Some anglers may want to make their own baits at home before they leave, preferring to use their own favourite flavours, attractors and base mixes. No problem. Nutribait's Preserver Bait allows you to do just this. Simply put 25 mils of Preserver Bait in with the eggs and add a pound of bait. Boil the rolled baits as normal then dry them thoroughly for a week to 10 days. In this form, they should keep for at least three months. Though many would consider making up fresh bait daily on the bank to be a bit of a bind, it is one of the most effective ways of fishing abroad. Base mixes incorporating egg replacers, such as the fish food mix and Enovite gold, can be taken to the lake in their dry powder form and then made up as necessary using lake water instead of eggs. Mind you, that's assuming you and your party are prepared to make a thousand baits a day for each angler on the trip, and that you're actually allowed to use a cooker. In many areas, in the south of France particularly, a very strict ban on all cookers and naked flames is imposed due to the risk of forest fires. Penalties for breaking the law can include lengthy jail sentences, not to be recommended. There are no carp in French prisons, Finally, it's a good idea to take some highly flavoured hook baits and pop-ups to use over the bait carpet. These pop-ups were made using microwaved high nouvelle and have been soaking in neat multimino for eight months. Make sure you take plenty of neat liquid attractors, flavours or liquid food additives with which to prepare your seeds and groats. Let's make no bones about it. You're not going to France to mess about catching little commons and the odd double. You're going to France to fish for monsters, the fish Come. of your dreams. So yes. don't prat around with namby-pamby rods and reels. They may be fine for English twenties, but they are about as much use as a broken toothpick when it comes to coping with carp of 50, 60 or even oh. 70 pounds in weight. Leave your dainty little through-action two-pound test curve rods at home and get hold of a set of real animals. These 12-foot, diaromorphous, two and three-quarter pound test curve jobs are what you're after. They'll cast to the horizon, handling four-ounce leads with consummate ease, and they are capable of taming even the meanest of wild French carp. Due to their fast taper design, they are ideal when a fast and effective long-range line pickup is called for. But, at the same time, you'll find they have got loads of power in the butt for handling massive fish close in under the tip. And don't mess about with reels either. Diawa 3000 SS models holding at least 300 yards of 15 pound nylon are the reels for France. It's pointless taking anything less. We'll look at tackle in more detail as we go along, but it is important to be clear in your own mind about what you may come up against. There are no compromises allowed where massive French carp are concerned. Hooks too need to be meaty and strong. These size 1 Fox Series 2 carp hooks are ideal, as are the new gold label penetrator hooks, which are similar in design, and we'll be putting them to the test at Rainbow Lake. Top class hooks are hard to track down in France, so take a good stock for all the party. And the same goes for lead weights and for nylon line. Remember, all carp tackle is expensive in France, so make sure you won't be caught out. Take more than you'll need, if there's room. Choice of line is up to you. But make sure it's up to the job of tackling the size of carp and the sort of snags you're likely to find in French lakes and rivers. The same goes for hook link material. And once we get to the lake, we'll be taking a closer look at rigs and hook links in more detail. It will soon become clear that there's seldom any need for complicated rigs. Keep things simple. At the same time, being prepared for any eventuality. 
This material is Quicksilver Snag Leader. It is very useful stuff and may well earn you a big carp on the bank when you may otherwise have lost it in the snags or the weed. Even if you aren't expecting to encounter too many snags, why not err on the side of caution and pack a couple of spools? Many of the lakes you are likely to encounter were once thickly wooded forests and the underwater terrain may be strewn with tree stumps left behind when the valley was flooded. These make short work of ordinary mainline and nylon snag leaders. Once again, be prepared. A rod pod may or may not be needed on your chosen water, but it is as well to take one just in case. Once the French summer gets a grip, the banks of some carp waters quickly dry out until they become as solid as concrete. Finally, be sure to take a boat, any boat. A proper rubber inflatable or a solid fiberglass dinghy will be the best. But you will almost certainly need a boat of some kind as they are often vitally important for putting baits out and for baiting up. And hand in glove with a boat goes a life jacket. Never mind that you may be a good swimmer, always wear your life jacket. It is better to be safe than sorry. An echo sounder is very useful, as not only will it help you chart the lake bed, but it may also pinpoint snags, weed beds, the course of an old riverbed, even feeding fish. Some purists will have you believe that using a sounder is cheating, but then how many big lumps do the purists ever catch in France? Not many. Don't forget your own personal comfort. Though the days may be roasting hot, the nights can and do turn wickedly cold. Be prepared for all eventualities by taking a decent thermal suit to wear in your sleeping bag. And don't forget the wet weather gear either. Yes, it rains in France too, you know. Sometimes for days, even weeks on end. Boots, waders, chesties, they may all be needed at some point during your trip. So if you can find room for them, in the already crowded transport, leave nothing behind. You never know when you might want it. Finally, remember to pack a tube of sunblock. The average temperature in the Bordeaux region, even in September, is 25 degrees centigrade. That's lobster pink heat if you stay out in the sun too long. Being fried alive is not a lot of fun. Despite the tan you may eventually bring home with you once your skin grows back, you may be bringing something else back as well, like skin cancer. Right, we've got all the detailed preparation and planning out of the way. All that remains now is to go over there and wind them in. But wait a moment, haven't we forgotten something? There's still one little minefield across. Buying your permits. You'll be able to get permits in cafes, bars, the local post office, and of course, in tackle shops. What you must ask for is a carte de pêche. The guy behind the counter will note you are English and try to affix all kinds of weird and wonderful stamps to the card. Most of these are totally unnecessary. You must make it absolutely plain that you are fishing purely for carp. If possible, try and ask for une carte pour la carp uniquement, s'il vous plaît. Don't be tempted to try and get away with fishing without a permit. It is common to have your permits checked and the guard de pêche, who are responsible for checking permits, often ask to see your passport as well. Believe me, they know that old trick of borrowing a permit off a mate who went over earlier. Private waters, such as here at Rainbow Lake, are usually covered by their own fishing license. And if you are going to fish only private, fee-charging waters, you will not need a carte de pêche. This may sound pretty obvious, but you're going to have to eat while you're over there. French supermarkets offer an enormous range of fresh produce, as well as beer, wine and spirits, and all manner of typically French goodies. On the other hand, shopping in France is expensive these days. At the time of making this video, the exchange rate was about 7.5 francs to the pound. That means that almost everything is some 15 to 25% more expensive in France than its equivalent here in the UK. So, you are faced with a choice. Do you shop at home before you leave, or buy food over there? Well, the advantages of buying before you leave are worth thinking about pretty seriously. For a start, you can buy the sort of foods with which you are familiar. At the same time, 
releasing your stock of French francs for other purchases abroad. It will also be much easier to plan a daily menu if everything is bought in advance. On the other hand, all that grub takes up yet more precious room in the car. Room that may well be better filled with fishing gear and bait. The French do like their food. Indeed, they have an ongoing love affair with their stomachs. And while their grub may be more expensive, it's also miles better. At least take the time and trouble to buy French bread each day. It's the best bread in the world. And together with French unsalted butter and a wedge of thick runny camembert makes one of the great snacks of the world. Ask for une baguette s'il vous plaît. If nothing else, buying fresh bread at least helps you practice your French. Which brings me to one final aspect of the whole planning jigsaw, the French language. It cannot be stressed enough just how much even the poorest attempt to speak French will help you out. French people love to hear others struggle with their strange vowels and pronunciations. And even if you get it woefully wrong, it really does break the ice and open doors. You will find that the French will speak more freely and openly to you if you can speak a bit of their language. And believe it or not, the language becomes easier the more you speak it. Teach yourself cassettes and books such as this one, when in France, are easy to follow and highly recommended, as too is either a French phrase book or an English-French dictionary. So, that's the trip planned down to the last detail. Let's go get them. Well, we finally got our baits out in the water, a lovely place, but before we settled down we decided where to fish, we spent most of the day covering all over this lake, there's about 100 acres, in a boat with an echo sounder, and the place is full of features, I've never ever fished anywhere like it in England with so many bars and weed beds and snags. Do you, Mike? That's right, it's uh, up and down all over the place. Um, as you say, we spent about seven hours rowing around in the boat using the echo sounder, and what we've finally done is drop some markers at different depths um, to try and ascertain what channels the fish are moving through and at what depths they're feeding at. And um, hopefully um, by this time tomorrow we'll have seen a bit of action and uh, hopefully caught one or two fish and uh, found out what depths they're at and, and, and sort of, you know, uh, get onto the fish in yeah, a much better I way. I think the depth is very important on this place because we've found depths as little as about 12 inches deep going down to 50 foot in places. I mean the fish would probably be fine that they'd be feeding at a certain band in that depth. Yeah, there's lots and of weed on the top of the bars in there and then it just drops off into about 8-10 foot and the weed stops. Obviously the light isn't um, going to penetrate them sort of depths uh, at this time of year and therefore they're quite clear ideal places for presenting baits. Yeah that'd be the hardest thing to do is find out the routes they're taking on all these bars which are like motorways and then find out what depth they're feeding along the slopes and if we can get that sorted out and see a few fish I think we could be in for a good week don't you Mike? We'll go for it. Well 13 hour drive here we are. It's a long drive. A bit too bad actually with yeah. all the bad weather. Ooh. What we've done We've been over the, the whole swim here with the echo sounder, looking to see what features we can find. Uh, the best features really are two sort of bathtub shapes, nine metres deep. There were fish in it, not exactly on the bottom. But we've been right across, and we've put a marker out here. Around the marker we've baited up fairly well with particles and boilies, and uh, we've just been over it again, and we've seen fish on them already. For the rest, there's a lot of weed, a lot of up and downs. It's quite a difficult lake, I think, 
you don't know where the fish are coming through, but we've got a feeling they're going to come through on that deep spot. Don't know what you think about it. Yeah, I think we must uh, stride in the deep water and then, uh, then we'll see yeah. where the fish is coming from. Yeah. I think that's the best way to, uh, to try it. Feeling confident? Yeah, the weather's good. Weather's good. It's very important. Raining in Holland yeah. and we're standing yeah. here in the sun. What more could we ask for? Yeah. 50 pound carp? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's go for it. Yeah, let's do it. I'm pretty happy with what we've done so far, Bill. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. It's, um, you've got to make a start somewhere. New lake. Very difficult to read with all these islands out there. Features everywhere. Yeah, we, we've seen a couple of fish out there already, which I think is encouraging. These sturgeon are coming out well too, aren't they? Yeah, I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, I think they're the sort of fish that could move into a swim, wipe you out and then... Either wipe all the bait out or yeah. scare all the carp away. Yeah. Hard to tell, it's hard to tell. But we've got the crumb out there, we've got the particle out there. Uh, neither of us have gone particularly mad with it. What have you got, about eight kilos? I've done about four or five ki kilos of particles. Um, the mixed flake maize, party blend and groats. Right, yeah. Um, and about two kilos of bait over the top. That's fair enough, because I'm going to fish stringers, just, just stringers off to the right there. Yeah. Uh, right right the under, that, under that burnt tree there. Right. Uh, we've had the sounder out over there. Uh, found about 15 foot shallowing up very, very quickly. Uh, and it looks quite a hard bottom on the echo sounder. So that looks quite tasty to me. So I'm just yeah. going to fish stringers over there because I've got you on one side with the particle and I've got John on the other side with, me, with, the, with the particle. And I think the big fish could be coming through and just pick up stringers in the middle. Yeah, I, I think also we should never forget the margins. I mean, everybody, I think, traps it off to France and wants to fish on up. Too right, too right. You know, 150 yards away, but we've seen, we've fish, seen a fair few fish down this margin already. You never know, you might have a chance in here. Yeah, I, I've kept the bait in very light down here tonight. You know, we can always put more in tomorrow. Yeah, I think I'm going to fish about 40 yards out with my so-called inside rods, and the other two will boat across. Hmm. Yeah. But um, otherwise, well, we've just got to wait and see, haven't we? It's early days yet. We've got seven days to go. Yeah, I think we need to keep the boat at the ready there because there's a lot of right. snags out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although we're fishing 10, 15 yards away from them. Yeah. Got to be yeah. ready to change uh, the game plan up to a, to, to a certain extent. Yeah, that's right. The particle doesn't work, doesn't get an e a fairly instant hit. We've got to cut back on it, I think, and just go boil Yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit wary of the particle because the breathe fish, they always used to reckon that they used to spook on beds of particle, uh, didn't this they? This is right. Yeah, that's right. But I think, I think a little bit will not hurt. Fingers crossed time, eh? Go for it. What would you like, sir? A nice Kevin Maddox, please. Nice and grey on the ends, you know? Oh, OK, yeah. then. And you want it completely shaved? Uh, well, yeah, on the top, yeah. OK, and yeah, there's just... things crawling about in here, so would you like those removed? Um, no, I'll leave those. OK. Oh, one's bit me. <laughs> <coughs> Do you want this left on? Yes, yes. <laughs> OK. Right, OK. And what about the top, sir? Yeah, just like Kevin, nice and thin, you know? Okay, then, yeah. right. okay. Anyway. I'll just trim this up here. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Something, <laughs> Something yeah. for the weekend, sir? Uh, five, please. <laughs> <laughs> we go. Thirty-two pounds. 
first fish from Rainbow Lake for me. Came close in. Went crazy. Out towards the margins on the other side. Caught a little snag on the way. But pretty well behaved after that. I think she's out to swim back in the lake now. Recognise this one. Long term that. Happened a long time ago, well healed. If you see that fish again, you'll know it's Dave's fish. I was going to say well behaved. But if I do that, it's going to jump all over the place. So, back you go. There she is, cracking mirror, 37 pound exactly. And the first fish from Rainbow Lakes. Lovely scale mirror. Just lay her down gently here. Have a look at the mouth. And you can see there, full curtain membrane. Possibly never been caught, if ever. Not often. Lovely looking fish. Fish was caught on a boilie, popped up over a large bed of particles at a range of about 60, 65 yards in about seven to eight foot of water. Five o'clock in the morning and uh, a very lively fight indeed. I'll just put a little, little bit of water on her before she goes back. Actually, I'll use lake water here. Lovely scaled fish. And as I say, a super fight, very healthy. Here she goes. All right, I'm gonna put the fish back now. Easy does it. Put her back in gently. Make sure I don't go with her. There you go. Lovely fish. The rods I've chosen to use are the new Kevin Maddox KM Challenger rods. I've gone for the 12 and a half foot 3 pound version as it's a rather large water with many snags and you need a good, good solid rod with plenty of backbone. The, the eyes on the rod are silicone carbide in a nice gold finish and uh, they really look the part, there's no doubt about it. I've mixed that in with Shimano bait runner reels, die would have been okay as well. They're good rods and you need a good reel to go with them. And I think I've made a good choice. There are two schools of thought concerning rigs for French carp fishing. One says, if it works in the UK, take it, use it, no matter how complicated or secret it may be. The other says, keep things simple. Let's face it, your average French carp is less rig shy than its English counterpart. That said, Several of the better known French waters now require quite advanced presentations, so keep an open mind. Your rigs may need a bit more thought. For the most part, however, standard presentations will do the job. The emphasis, as with many items of tackle, is on the strength. As far as hook link material is concerned, you won't go far wrong using either 25 pound Christon Merlin, Silkworm, or 20 pound super silk, or if you prefer using monofil, either 20 pound amnesia, abulon 20 pound test, or 15 pound Barclay big game. All are highly recommended. You might also like to consider using a combi link of mono and braid. Hooks need to be strong, extremely sharp, and available in a wide variety of sizes. There are many good hooks on the market, but we suggest 
you use a pattern with which you are familiar. Many anglers fishing in France prefer to use inline leads like these, marketed by Mike Wilmot's essential products. You will notice that they are flattened to varying degrees and as such are ideal for holding on ledges or slopes and to counteract drag and subsurface currents so common on big French water supply reservoirs like Lac du Daire. Alternatively, trilobe leads do a similar job. As with the hooks, it's a case of use what you are most happy with. For instance, if you prefer to use helicopter rigs, particularly if you're casting from the bank rather than rowing your hook baits out, go ahead and use them. Uh, By the way, you'll find that ounce or ounce and a half leads are totally useless for all but the smallest of French lakes. So equip yourself with a plentiful supply of three to four ounce leads, bearing in mind that in extreme circumstances, even these will not be heavy enough to hold bottom on big lakes and fast flowing rivers. You could go on forever screwing your head up thinking about the best rigs for France. So here are a few suggestions that might just help you. You'll notice that for the most part they are pretty simple, straightforward and strong. First off, here's a rig that is many people's first choice. Nothing fancy, just a three ounce essential products lead 12 to 14 inches of Christon 25 pound Merlin, continued through the eye to produce a hair long enough to take two 20 millimeter bottom baits. The hook in this instance is a size two Fox series two. You will notice that we have attached a hefty stringer using Christon Meltdown PVA to draw attention to the hook bait. This next rig is ideal if you wish to fish a pop-up hook bait once again, we've used the essential products lead, but this time we've used a CombiLink hook length of approximately eight inches of 20 pound amnesia with an inch to two inches of Christon 25 pound silkworm. These are joined via a tiny stainless steel ring from Kesmark, which incidentally is ideal for molding your putty around. The bait in this instance is a Nutribait's classic combination pop-up, which has been sprayed with the relevant bait soak to add to its attraction qualities even further. Finally, for lovers of monofilament stiff rig presentations, here's a rig that has accounted for a tremendous number of fish, both in the UK and abroad. As you can see, this is a helicopter setup using a tadpole lead and rubbers. The hook link is 20 pound amnesia, but the hair in this instance is eight pound super silk. Note the loop at the swivel end which makes this particular rig so effective. We'll leave it there, as this is a video about fishing in France, not one about tying rigs. The key points with any rig are its strength, reliability, and most important, your own confidence in its effectiveness. Gently does it.
pretty fish. Got to be 18 or 19. 20 for mum. I think we'll just pop her straight back. Go. Oh, that hooks in nice and straight, nice and tight. Yes. Not to get caught in there, yeah. There we go. In you go. Come back when you're 30 pounds. Then you'll make a picture. Here's a 25 I caught earlier. Caught on a pop-up, close to the bank. Shot off in that direction towards the point, which we call Shooter's Point because of the hide. Came back down along towards me. Got stuck in the sunken tree for a couple of minutes. And then back as sweet as you like. No problem at all. See if we can get her in without dropping her. After two nights at Rainbow Lake, this is my third fish. Uh, after last night's success, which was 37 pound, we've got this beauty here, at 40 pound, four ounces. A small fish of about eight pound fell in between. This one came about 1.30 in the morning, after a consistent two hours of fish crashing out all over the baits. I'm just going to give him a little bit of water and pull him back out. Cracking mirror, 40 pound 4 ounces to be exact, just crept over the 40 mark. Again, on the boilie, popped up, fruit flavour boilie, over a large bed of particles. The fish was caught in a narrow channel in seven foot of water, a depth which we found to be very productive with fish movement during the time we've been here at Rainbow Lake. A tremendous fight again, and a cracking fish, which I'm now gonna slowly put back. While we're on the subject, holding big fish, a very good method to, to hold big fish is to use your knees, as you can see I'm doing here, as a support for your forearms. And when you bend down, it's just no weight whatsoever. There you go. Hand positions, middle of your fingers in between the pecs, make sure they can't move, and your other hand around your anal fin, and they're not gonna go very far. When you're on the bank, make sure obviously you've always got an unhooking mat. On the water, it's not so apparent. Here we go. She's getting heavy, so it's time to put her back. Cracking fish, there you go. Always make sure they go off safely. A few air bubbles. Just turn around. One more look on the other side. Wee. Steady go. at four o'clock in the morning, dreaming about 30. This one picked up, stormed up the lake, gave me 15 minutes of excitement. And I'm glad to say, after 40 years of fishing, after I got it in the net, I was shaking. 
fantastic. Come on, settle down. This will be one of the fish stocked in November. Ex-breed, enjoying his stay down here in the margins, hopefully. Off you go. Great. It's been a strange first three days, really, hasn't it? You could say that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I lost a good fish last night from down the margins. Took about 40, 50 yards of line straight off and then found the snag that we never even knew was there, which is a little bit frustrating. Right, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm glad I had that little carp, though, the other day, because at least it shows, shows we're doing something right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, not, yeah, not enormous by any means, was it? But uh, it's a start. Carp to carp. Yeah, that's right. I think the sturgeon might have moved in as well, because we're having a few little pulls and bleeps here. Well, we've seen that one crash this morning as well, haven't we, on the long spot? Quite impressive when they come out, aren't they? Yeah. Like an arrow coming straight out the water. Yeah, I shouldn't mind one of them. No, that's right, yeah. They say they go like taupe. You've never had a taupe, have you? No. <laughs> you wouldn't want one either. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, I think we just keep doing what we're doing. And hope for the best, eh? Yeah. Looks like it's working. I think we're doing right by fishing the shallow water and the deep water. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'll wait and see what happens. What depth did your fish come in? 15 foot, I think. Did it? Yeah, the one I, I lost was in about 8, I think. I had the sounder out there on the marker there, and it's there's, a, there's something strange out like a sunken tree or something, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. came out really clear, the, 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 the snag on the, on the echo sounder. I think there's a lot more snags between us and the island than we at first thought. Yeah. You know, because well, what did you lose that fish on? Was I don't that, know. It yeah. just went absolutely solid. I've gone over it with the finder, yeah. and there's something there, but I wouldn't have thought it was a tree or anything, but I suspect it probably is. Mm. Um, went absolutely solid. Um, you know, we got above it in the boat, but nothing. It was just absolutely solid in there, and about, I don't know, 15, 20 foot down. There's not, there's not a lot we could have done. Still happy with what we're doing, though, eh? Yeah, I think so. I see no reason to move. The wind's switching our way rather than... The other way, I think. Uh, yeah. There's not a lot of wind, but it's coming our way, I think. Now. This this overcast might help as well. Yeah. If you're in England, you'd be saying, right, this is just on now, mm. isn't it? Wind's turned around southwest, right. clouded over. High pressure's obviously moved out a bit. Yeah. I know Mike's had a couple of fish, but apart from that, there's not been a lot out. No, no. But I think they're as good here as anywhere. Yeah, I think we're on for a lump somehow. Yeah, I think well, so. Hope we are anyway. Well, it's a difficult time now. Yeah. We've lost sure. a lot of fish. As I said, at the beginning of uh, this trip, there's a lot of snags out here, a lot of problems, and uh, we've experienced them all. We've lost about 14 fish, I think. Yeah, also 40 fish. We didn't get one of them very close to the side. <laughs> Probably 10 metres was it, and they got in the other snags. It's a difficult, very difficult swim. We're not really sure what to do now. The fish is going uh, away from here now. Yeah. fish are definitely moved now. out. Uh, I do like the swim, though. Yeah, me too. I think we must stay here. Yeah. Wait till the fish come back. Yeah. Change the rigs, change the hooks. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. We've got to try something. Yeah. We're not actually getting snapped up, are we? It's just that all the hooks are pulling out. Yeah. So something's going then, wrong. They're going into those snags and shedding the hooks. Yeah. I think we must try it here. I mean, your one, it shed the hook and we came home with half a tree. I mean, I don't <laughs> know how he did that. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I don't understand it. We stay him? Yeah. We stay I think. We'll go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get him. Let's do it. Okay. All right. Ken? You in, mate? Yeah. <laughs> Looks a lump. No, it's not going a lot. Quite solid. Oh, my God. All right. How is it? I'll get him out in a minute.
Yeah, on. yeah. It's coming. I've got a feeling this could be number one, don't you? Them die was a nice rod, aren't they? Yeah. Get might have some weed on it. It's not yeah. growing a lot, it's just coming straight in. Going off to the right a bit. You like yeah, the other rods? I think so. I'll bring it under them. God, it could be a bit warmer, couldn't it? It's 75 degrees in the middle of March. <laughs> Just not good enough. Why haven't I got this quicksilver on? Aye, aye, yeah. Right you ready? No, it's way out yet. Sturgeon. That'll do. The very first sturgeon. Come to daddy. Show sure it's all in. It's not a bad one. Oh dear me. <laughs> You're gonna need a bigger net. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Preston all right. What's this Preston bit then? Preston? Preston Sturgeon. Preston Sturgeon, the famous film director. Lost on me. You'll have to ask Liam about that. He knows, he knows all these film directors. Lost on me. There you go. Pop up again. Yep. Queen Kajowza? Yeah. Oh, dear me. I don't know how you're supposed to hold these. They're like a taupe. Oh, fantastic. Hello, baby. Woohoo. <laughs> Look at that mouth. Four barbels. No wonder they like them cream kajowsers. This is one of those ones with a tag in them. Yeah. I think you win a thousand pounds. Here we go. Two in four hours. 26 and... 19 and a quarter. 19 and a quarter. Funny looking carp though, aren't they? Just a bit. Wouldn't mind a few more like this though, No, they? no, no. They're pretty special. Tri Trifle a long snout on them. Big powerful pecs. Very hard fighting fish. Well, turned, turned out, out nice, nice again. again. <laughs> go on, my son, then. Back you go. Come back when you're a 50. <coughs> Slip her back. under 26 pounds. Three nights into the session, and here we are with a couple more lumps from last night. My particular fish was 31 pound eight ounces and was the only fish of the night. A very quiet night, nowhere near as many fish crashing out as the previous night and uh, it was the only fish as I say when it came at 10 o'clock again on the same area I've lack I've uh, put in less bait in at the moment just uh, slacking off on the amount of bait I'm putting in hoping to uh, increase the chances of my hook bait being picked up and then following this fish was Paul's fish what time's yours Paul Caught mine five o'clock in the morning. My first proper fish at the lake gave a terrific fight. I was just beginning to think I missed my chance when it started to get light. Then off it roared. Beautiful fight, tore off about 50 yards of line and uh, gave a really nice account of itself. 
caught you from a new spot, somewhere I tried for the first night, moved on, somewhere I saw some fish rolling, and uh, caught it right in the margins. Very nice. Nice, easy fishing. And uh, as I say, it gave a great fight. Looking forward to another one tonight, even bigger, I hope. Time to put them back? I think so, don't you, Mike? Yep, let's give it a go. See if I can slip in. Lovely fish. Lovely catch you again. I'm a bit bigger. About 50 pound, I hope. Off you go. Go on, you beauty. Hey, Paul, I'm following you in. Right, there we go, Mike. Okay, off she goes. What's the echo sounder reading now, Ken, depth wise? About 12 foot. Just keep going, it'll come up to about 8. Yeah? Yeah, right on. She's gone. Okay, just put about half a kilo of bait down there, and no problem, just a bit of bait. Yeah, I would have thought so. We put we put a fair bit out there this morning. That should do it. Okay, I'll just put another kilo in for luck then. Morning, Liam. Got another one for you. Got another one foot to camera. Hope you like it. I had to go all the way out of there into the weed in the boat in the middle of the night. Just 16 pounds. What about that? Yeah, Not your 30, but nice little mirror. Caught him just there, four, four feet off the, the reeds by my left here. Bye-bye. Stay. Well, don't, don't you want to... Liam, I mean, you're taking... Come on, what are you doing? Oh, look, come on, look, I've got a fish here. Liam, it's only a little one, but come on. Oh, you're going for the stars, are you? Oh, hell. All right, no worries, no worries. Next time, <whistles> for a 30. Come on, mate. You can go back in here. I'll take a still of you later. 
bloody film directors. Not exactly what we came to the south of France for, but it'll do. For 14 or 15 pounds mirror, caught on a higher track pop-up when not a lot else was happening. Pretty fish though. I think we made the right decision to actually stay in this swim. Uh, the fish did come back as we thought they might, especially when the wind turned, they came back very quickly. But unfortunately the snags are horrendous and everything that we tried to get these fish out, it just didn't work, did it? Yeah, it's terrible. It's unbelievable. I understand. And we've lost all of us some big fish. Uh, there are big fish in here, we knew that. But there's, there's plenty of fish in here. Yeah. You could see them on the echo sander. We lost about, I think, between us, and it sounds really pathetic, actually, we lost yeah. over 30 fish. Yeah. That's the truth. I lost my it's best fish ever. Yeah. Yeah, I lost a whacker. No, Dion did. No. Down there. Yeah. yeah. Cass kept us awake all night, losing whacker after whacker. Yeah. yeah. But, but the fish was definitely here. Oh, the fish it's came back. It's a beautiful lake, there's no doubt yeah. about it. And this is probably the best swim for getting a lot of fish in into a bay, it's, the, it's here. But the snags, yeah. I reckon we've got to come back and see if we can do something different next time. Yeah. yeah. I like it here. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lovely place. Yeah, it's a beautiful lake. We're and trying again. Yeah. And the people are friendly. Honey Monster and Dave. Yes. They're going to love me when they see this. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've come to the end of our week at Rainbow Lake. A week which started very well indeed with the first three nights producing a fair bit of action, uh, culminating in the biggest fish at 40 pounds, four ounces. Um, it's been a bit of a mixed fortune trip, really. Um, as I say, uh, a lot of it was uh, wind dictative. We found the fish, and uh, we uh, reaped the benefits for finding them fish. Um, but unfortunately, on the third, third night, after the third night, the wind changed direction, and uh, whistled down to the far end of the lake and it was uh, back to basics, back to finding the fish again. Um, and after that point, um, you know, we worked very hard fishing four different swims over the past four nights. We couldn't really get back onto the big fish and um, Paul had a, had a fish last night on the last night. Yeah, we were very fortunate to start with Mike, weren't we? Well, we were, yeah. yeah we, we, we dropped in, found the fish yeah. in the bay. Mm. I think the lessons to be learned from the week overall is that these fish, they're very nomadic. There's a big mm -hmm. water, lots of features, lots of bays, lots of contours on the bottom, up and down, and the fish, they very definitely follow the wind. And uh, we started off fishing a nice shallow bay full of silt, nice rich feeding area for the fish and uh, the wind was blowing in there and we started off very well. We had five fish in the first three nights, Mike. That's right, five yeah, fish, 40, yeah. 40, 230s, it was, um, and a 25, it was a nice start. Unfortunately for us, I think the week could have carried on like that. That's right. But the wind turned round and the fish, they just disappeared. Suddenly the, the, the bay was just empty of fish. And then that was when the hard work started. We spent the next day rowing and walking. Typical French fishing, you know, you've got to be mobile, you've got to get out and actually look around, try and travel light. And um, as I say, at the end of the day, it's typical French fishing. I've never had an easy trip yet. It's always hard work. Yeah, the harder you work at it, the mm. better you get mm. in the end. And uh, there's a real lesson in it. But all in all, it's, it's been pretty good. You know, yeah. we're, we're pleased. Yeah, we've had a lovely time. The weather's mm. been nice and the scenery's brilliant. And I look forward to coming back again. Yeah, yeah, I look forward to it. Yeah, good stuff. Been a strange old week, though, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it has. It's, uh, it's difficult, though, you know, a new water. Water we don't know. There's a lot of features in it, isn't there? And, a fair head of fish, but not a colossal amount, I don't think. No, I'm happy with the uh, with the fish that we've caught. At least we've caught a couple of carp. Yeah, it shows that we're doing something right. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, that was my first carp last night, which wasn't enormous, but there you go. Happy with the sturgeon? Yeah, very happy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was hoping to get one. Yeah, to, me too. And to get one just under 26 is a bonus. Well, it's nice know, that we had them together. It yeah, proved what right. we said the other day, that those fish had moved in, those sturgeon. Yeah, I think when they move in, they just clear you out and, and that's your lot. I, don't, I think if you do get a lot of sturgeon on here, you're going to lead an awful lot of bait. Yeah, I think so. Because they're going to go through it like a dose of salt. That's right. Well, it was we... nice to have the brace, wasn't it? Yeah, we've got a night left, though. I mean, anything can happen on the last night. That's right. That's right, indeed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Eternal optimists, eh? That's it. That's They've it. got to be, haven't you? Yeah, sure have. Okay, as we come towards the end of our film, 
perhaps this is an opportune time to reflect and to summarise the whole complex issue of fishing in France. By now you will hopefully have realised that it isn't simply a matter of getting off the ferry and casting out. Look through the film once again to remind yourself of the salient points. The bait, the tackle, the ferry route, the driving, the lake itself, and your plans for how to approach it. Then sit back, relax, and dream about the huge French carp that is just destined to cross your path sooner or later. Remember, French carp are no different to English ones. They follow the same rules, are driven by the same instincts. If in doubt, always follow the wind, particularly a warm, moist south or southwesterly. Keep the bait going in, sparingly, but often, until you're sure that the fish are on your bait in numbers. Then you can feel free to pile it in to keep the carp in your swim. Hold down boat and bankside disturbance to a minimum. Imagining you are on your favourite small water in the UK. Always keep an open mind about how you are fishing. It may well be that, as in this film, a mobile strategy works better than sitting it out in one swim. On the other hand, quite often French carp take two or three days to home in on a big carpet of bait. So bear in mind that you may be moving out of a swim just as it is about to come to life. Treat France and the French people with the respect you would expect others to show for the British and the UK. You'll find the French are, for the most part, open, kind and generous. A simple attempt to speak their language, no matter how badly, often results in your welcome being even more warm and friendly. Treat the countryside with respect, even if it appears that the French themselves are not always the most ecologically aware nation. It is asking for trouble and aggravation from the guard to pêche if you leave litter, scatter the banks with empty bottles and use toilet paper, behave aggressively, or get out of your skull on French wine. Regard the lake and its inhabitants and the local French people in the same way you would expect them to behave if they were on your own local water. That way, you should find that there will be few, if any, obstacles strewn in your way that could spell the ruin of the entire trip. Finally, don't go over there expecting monster carp. Sure, there are some massive carp in France. And certainly, the average weight is higher than in the UK. However, there are literally countless numbers of twenties and doubles in the French lakes and rivers, the sort of fishing we could only dream about over here. So bear in mind that you may have to wade through the nuisance carp, the 18s, 19s and 20s, before you get to the really big lumps. Remember, patience is a virtue. We hope you have enjoyed this all too brief look at the basics of carp fishing in France. Though the session has taken place on the banks of the fabulous Rainbow Lake, it could equally well have been filmed on the banks of any of the thousands of out-of-the-way ponds, stretches of river, or lacs du barrage that abound in France. The advantage you have when you book to fish somewhere like Rainbow Lake is that you know in advance the sort of fishing you can expect. The uncertainty of fishing a public water is removed and you will be able to devote yourself full time to the all important pursuit of the carp themselves without having to bother about permits and night fishing bans or even wondering if the lake has carp in it in the first place. At Rainbow Lake, you can be sure there are literally thousands of carp waiting for you to test your skill upon. The lake 
is one of the most attractive natural lakes in the whole of France, with more natural features than you'll probably encounter in a lifetime's fishing back home. All in all, France and Rainbow Lake in particular truly do represent ultimate carping. Thank you.